Hello, my name is Amelia Winger Bearskin, and I'm a performance artist who primarily works with interactive performance art as well as sound. And I am Seneca Cayuga Nation of Oklahoma on my mother's side. We're also known as the Haudenosaunee or the Iroquois. Um, thank you for joining me today, and I look forward to sharing my work with you. <laughs> We all three of us were working at an artificial intelligence lab on Wall Street and we were like, God, we make such weird and terrifying things, we should just be a band. And, you know, when you're teaching your future overlord that will probably kill you uh, about what it is to be human, um, we started thinking about how do we teach our future overlords now, who are probably going to kill us, which is like our children. So we usually teach them like lullabies. Okay, but did we really have like an AI lab? Yes, actually. We had a machine learning lab dedicated to the creative applications of machine learning. We had machine learning scientists, writers, um, UX designers and researchers, a whole gaggle of really fun and interesting people, um, all of whom were about a total of 12 and three of us, you can see, started uh, Lullabies for AI, the band, um, to sort of explore maybe the more poetic side of uh, machine learning. However, what we did in the lab actually was pretty weird or strange or interesting. Um, so you can see here in this, um, in this work, we would have artists in residence. We had Seth Kranzler here writing an AI-generated art critique of AI art. We also had Semantic Arithmetic by the artist Allison Parrish, and she looked at how you could take the standard types of algorithms for blending or Gaussian blur or other types of ways of looking at image um, manipulation and then looking if she could do that same thing to text. And that's sort of been the <clears throat> the majority of the work that she's done uh, throughout her life has been looking at AI and semantics and poetry uh, through machine learning. You can see here that she looks at the connection between words and then puts them in vectors and then applies those same kind of things. Here, Here is a blurred image and then the blurred text of Thomas Jefferson and Mary Shelley's Frankenstein two people who are sort of Frankensteining a bunch of uh, ideology and information at a similar time. We also have uh, Gene Kogan looking at how he can make machine learning more accessible to artists through a lot of the different types of libraries that he developed. And if you go to ml4a.org, you can look at a lot of the libraries. And it's a really good introduction to machine learning. A lot of the early projects he was looking at style transfer and the way in which you could take style transfer and apply it to live video. At the time, this wasn't something that was really available um, <laughs> like in Prisma app or in other types of apps. Like now, I think it's quite easy to download an app and kind of like look at the world through style transfer. If you're not familiar with style transfer as an algorithm, um, essentially you're training a neural network on uh, to look at an image and then apply the sort of line quality, color quality to another image um, and then remake that image. So it's not quite like a normal filter that we've seen in like the early 90s or two, early 2000s where you just change the edge you actually are able to separate an image from the background so you can kind of see the example there of like star wars or uh you know jungle book where they take that same image and they're actually separating the image from the background and redrawing each of those frames in a particular style 
was not only you know support artists that were looking at these technologies, but pairing them with uh, machine learning scientists to kind of optimize their processes, but also to really explain it um, through text and through interviews and through diagrams and through animations, so that people could understand what these um, what these sort of black box algorithms were doing. And this is this project here is by Tassie Kar Tarakajan. She is looking at how you can do gestural um, recognition as a convolutional neural network in virtual reality. And we kind of go through that process of, you know, how do you take a character that's drawn and when it goes through the different types of steps of that convolutional neural network, how is it able to detect what character it is? And it's based on, you know, early kind of CAPTCHA that people would use when they were on the internet and they would have to kind of like look at an image and then say, oh yeah, I recognize that that's an eight. Um, interestingly enough, that was actually training um, an early algorithm for how we would detect um, drawing for, for banking systems so that they could auto scan checks. And that's kind of the basis of um, character recognition in convolutional ne neural networks. Um, the very first project we actually did was with Aaron Arts, and he was very interested in um, creating sheet music that would be trained from a corpus of music that he found in, in lily pad format online. And so he did front forward neural networks and recurrent neural networks so that he could actually create sheet music from corpus of sheet music. And one of the emphasis for this was, you know, he, he is a, a famous keyboardist and is in many bands like uh, Beirut and Grizzly Bear. And um, when he was an early keyboardist, he was asked to perform um, for, um, to perform this almost impossible machine generated uh, keyboard set. And he was 19 years old, a prodigy and was just miraculously able to perform this incredible piece. Um, but he said it nearly killed him. It really wasn't written for a human it was what a machine would think is music if it never had to play it. And so he really wanted to create music that that understood the language of sheet music, which actually considers the human body and fingering and the ability to actually play it. So you don't need to be, you know, um, a 19 year old with incredible uh, adrenaline on stage night after night playing something that wasn't really meant for a human. And so he wanted to think about how you collaborate with machines and still consider the human body. Um, and so, you know, he, we we had kind of MIDI samples of this music, but really the performance was when he took his band and performed this music live um, at the end of his residency with us. And from then, I also was very interested in VR. And, you know, I've always been an artist, um, a performance artist and a video artist. And I began my work in virtual reality um, very like in the late 90s um, in a lot of these kind of simulatory environments and working with museums. We had sort of crazy types of headsets, but um, I made a virtual reality piece uh, called Your Hands or Feet. And I'll show you a little bit about that. There is that really crazy sound effect when the giant's leg gets shaved. That's this really strange sponge that I bought that's the worst sponge ever. Like, it's so bad at scrubbing dishes. And we sat there and we were listening to it and we were like, this is, this is the sound of shaving a giant's leg. This is perfect. I started out kind of my creative career as a writer and I was I was really interested in kind of experimental writing that leveraged different um, aspects of new technologies. So I got to this point where I was like, it's really fun to think about technology and how it's impacting us, but I would really rather be working directly with the technologies. I went to a grad program called ITP and I learned how to code. In my last year of grad school, VR suddenly came onto the scene as like, something that was going to be accessible for us to use. You know, 
Sarah was the first person I had met as an artist who was just working in VR in a more playful way. We just started brainstorming and thinking of moments when you virtually give someone a piece of your life, like in, in daily life. If I'm talking to Sarah and I'm trying to explain to her how I felt that morning or what I was thinking about the future, very frequently we prototype those kinds of experiences with sayings or with metaphors. So I can say like, I walked into that room and my stomach just dropped or it was so like loud that I felt like my ears were bleeding. Your Hands or Feet is a VR experience. It's an interactive exploration of new metaphors. The experience starts off where you're in kind of this surreal looking kitchen and you have in front of you a half dozen carton of eggs and inside of each egg is contained an experience that has some kind of psychologically complex action to it that we hope acts as something that you think back on and you're like, wow, this is such a strange feeling. It kind of reminds me of, for instance, like that time that I felt like my hands were feet. I don't know, I feel like my mind is a confusing machine. What we're really doing here is we're creating these metaphors that like maybe don't exist, but might apply in a situation as like the perfect way to describe this thing. In the beginning, I started with a basic treatment. So I created a lot of 3D assets to just sort of mock up this world, sort of the look and feel. And we came up with this idea of having it be like a half dozen experiences from you know a half egg carton and how we would move from each each space landing on the visuals for any project is an interesting process you know you have to make something that feels true to something that you like but it also has to be something true to what the other person likes Sarah said she had this amazing friend, Neve Bavarsky, in LA, who was an uh, illustrator. We reached out to Neve and, you know, showed him all of the reference imagery, showed him our very tight color palette of what we were trying to go for. And we were like, can you do the Neve version of your hands or feet universe? And then from there, um, we were like, how are we gonna put this thing together? Because translating from 2D into 3D seems easy, but to keep the same visual style is not always so straightforward. It made a lot of sense like for us to approach it with a style that's inviting and not like depressing or scary, but just a little bit scary maybe. It's really helpful to like take those two concepts and then give it to one person that can execute that so that it stays really consistent. So we were like, let's try this tool, Medium, which is a 3D um, VR sculpting tool. And so we felt like, oh, this is perfect that we found this, this way to find like a slice of what we were interested in, a way that we can produce it in a really organic and fun way. And that's kind of how we landed on the visual style that we're at right now. A lot of our music is gonna be generative. So generative music is when you're really designing those whys, therefores, and ifs. You know, normally you listen to a song and it's got the beginning and the middle of the end and there's like nothing you can do about it. But in an interactive song, there's ways that you can alter parts of it so that way you're sort of participating with the music. Every object that you pick up is like contains an audio track. Depending on which objects you interact with, you're really flushing out what the soundscape of that environment is. Me and Sarah are doing all this work to create a really fun playground. We might have kind of serious concepts about the emotional resonance behind each of the interactions, which we have very long and engaged conversations about, like even the, the physicality of grabbing that object, that action has to be connected. So we want each of the interactions to also be analogous to a place in time that you might have had that feeling. When I look at it from an outside perspective, I'm like, a lot of these things have to do with frustration, but a lot of them also have to do with joy and feeling joy while doing something frustrating. And so I want to give people a moment where they can interact with that quality of VR, where they can say, this is an extension of my brain and my experience within the world. This isn't the real world. This is the computational amalgamation of human understanding in this world. And I want to give people an opportunity to interact with that and interface with that. When we explain it to people, they just get it and they're excited about it, even though it's like, Oh, it's like an experience where your hands are feet because don't you ever just feel like a weird feeling and you don't know how to describe it and it's like something you've never felt before? Well, isn't VR the perfect way to kind of explore that? And people are like, oh yeah, that makes perfect sense. And I'm like, really? <laughs> so that's been pretty surprising also.
And after your hands or feet, um, I made a project uh, with the with Google's um, experimental camera, which was a, a 360 uh, video camera that had a little bit of volumetric capture with it as well. Um, it was part of the Jump Creators program. And I worked with my really good friend, the artist Wendy Redstar. We were interested in exploring um, our indigenous backgrounds and especially around the hi joint histories we had about monsters. And we wanted to create a 360 video and go to her reservation to the Red Star Ranch and to film the sites where a lot of these monsters uh, were said to have been seen. And throughout the process, we ended up really discovering the meaning of what a monster is in our culture, which actually the word for the specific type of monster we were looking at in her tribe is also known as um, the little people or keepers of the land. And we started thinking about that relationship um, of like, who is the monster and who is a monster because they're protecting the land. And we asked people at the end of this installation, um, would you be a monster with us? And um, the work that I've been doing this year is within a research framework called Antecedent Technology. Right now, I'm working on a project called Wampum.codes. It's a project with Mozilla a foundation, a fellowship with embedded at MIT's uh, co-creation studio with Kat Sizak. And um, I've been working on the history of wampum and, and how that connects to software development and ethics and ethical dependencies in software development. And I'd like to read you a little statement that I wrote about that. If history was written by the victors, then the future will be written by the vectors. Artificial intelligence will radically change our world, our lives, our planet, and it remains to be seen if it will be a positive or a negative. If it's said that those who fail to study history are doomed to repeat it, I would add that those who ignore data have underfitted models. When Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin were looking for a new model to serve as a basis for the United States government, they were very impressed by the Iroquois Confederacy, we call ourselves the Haudenosaunee, people of the Longhouse, were made up of the Seneca, Cayuga, Oneida, Onondaga, Mohawk, and Tuscarora. Thomas Jefferson spent over a year with us in upstate New York in one of our largest cities. When Jefferson and Franklin and the other founding fathers drafted the U.S. Constitution, they cherry-picked the best parts that were most beneficial to their own political purposes, the bits that seemed to align the best with their Enlightenment-era ideology representation, voting, checks and balances, etc. But they left out the social and cultural networks that sustained these practices in the actual Iroquois Confederacy. Well, what do they leave out? In the Iroquois Constitution, women, clan mothers from each tribe were the only ones who could vote for the representative who was always a man, a chief. Actually, the word for clan mother and chief is the same word. There was a balance of power. Only men could serve and only women could vote. Their economy was driven through complex agricultural arrangements. Everyone in the community participated in planting and harvesting. It was not an economy of slavery-dependent plantation agriculture. This is an example of colonial mindset. I see it, I like it, I want it, I'll take it. I take it and I take what will benefit my own paradigm, but I'm unconcerned with the effect it will have being taken out of context and the effect it'll have on the people I take it from. This is like trying to run a program without checking its dependencies. What if it turns out that the Confederate democracy or lasting peace and prosperity is dependent upon a balance of power along gender lines or upon a different economic model than the one practiced by European settlers in North America? Or what if it imagines a system of agriculture where the environment is protected and maintains sus sustainable practices? We all have colonial mindsets just because our culture has colonial mindset. But here's the thing, we're not colonial subjects and we don't have to live under a colonial empire anymore. In data science, we talk about models suffering from either overfitting or underfitting. Overfitting is when a model exhibits a low degree of bias, but a high degree of variance. In other words, it accepts a lot of differences within the data, but it doesn't have very much predictive power. Underfitting is the inverse of this, high bias, low variance. This is what happens when you make a generalization without enough data or when the data is not diverse enough to represent the real world. The big problem with colonial mindset is one of underfitting, extracting idea without the context that made that idea work in the first place. I'm here to say don't colonize our future. 
Our plans for the future need to include more data from diverse cultures and societies and not only those ideas that flatter what we already think. For instance, let's say you want to lay the groundwork for a society run on the blockchain. What does that look like? How does that work? What are the consequences? If we don't have significant data, we might just have to wing it. But we actually have thousands of years of data about decentralized economies. The use of wampum um, among the Iroquois functioned as a decentralized distributed ledger of contracts, and it helped us govern, govern our society for centuries. Wampum is an example of what I've termed antecedent technology, and there are many more cases like this. In South America, the Inca had a Turing-complete system of knot tying called Kipu, which predated modern computing by hundreds of years. When we want to use powerful new technologies such as AI or blockchain, and we want as much data as we can to help us imagine positive change in the world, we do not need to throw out thousands of years of data that can fuel the next giant leaps our communities will make with technology. I want people to know that indigenous people had technologies that have solved complex issues. I want us to use their data to help us dream our future, and I want us to believe that just because we have had 500 years of slavery, worker exploitation, poverty, and gender imbalance, we have had thousands of years of peace, prosperity, and equality right here in the country where I'm standing right now. And so I've been using this research framework to look at how I can approach um, ethics as software dependencies, sort of like you could imagine in your package.json on your software package, you would have to include um, the ethics, the, the communal agreements, the compacts that your community has decided are valuable so that the software that you make can't function without its ethical dependencies. And so I've been working on um, you know, co-creating these concepts with my community and with other software developers and and doing that work of of meeting and co-creating with other developers and I was interested in in holding some events and in um, you know I was going to participate in Katzi's ex amazing indigenous del digital delegation um and then well we had a pause and I did what I guess, you know, a lot of people did, which is uh, start a podcast. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I I called all my friends um, who uh, are indigenous, who use new technologies to do amazing and cool things. And yes, a lot of my friends were like, do you have enough of those to actually make a podcast? And you know, the answer is actually yes. I have, there's a ton of indigenous people working in AI and VR and cutting edge technologies. Um, you know, the internet has kind of a low barrier for entry, but also it's, it's really where a lot of culture is happening right now. Big surprise. So, um, yeah. So I started just talking to my friends about the cool stuff they're making and also the cool stuff they're not making because we're sheltering in place and having, a lot of uh, time to think about our process and our heritage and our cultures. And uh, I'll let you guys hear a little bit of that. Hello, I'm Amelia Winger Bearskin, the host of Wampum.codes. Uh, we are brought to you with generous support from the Mozilla Foundation and the co-creation studio at MIT. I interview native and indigenous artists, activists, technologists, entrepreneurs, inventors, and all around cool people. And I'll let our first guest of our very first podcast introduce herself. Great. Yeah. Uh, well, my name is Asha Viraswamy. I am an indigenous uh, storyteller, creative director, and digital media producer that really focuses on AR. VR and XR technologies and how we transition to those in in the 21st century. Skeno swagwego on the way as that need yaso agat senoni nanto yes. My name is Erica Tremblay or on the way as that is my Cayuga name, and I'm super happy to be here and talk with you today. Comment. <laughs> I know. I have like, you know, people always ask you, they're like, do you know any other Native American Jews? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of them. <laughs> There's like a few. I mean, 
I think it's so funny. I get that all the time too. And I uh, grew up with a few. So it didn't seem so weird. Like I went to preschool at my temple and I feel like probably a third of my class was like little brown Jewish kids. <laughs> <That's amazing. laughs> but I also grew up in Santa Fe, New Mexico. So yeah. that's probably where you're going to find the majority of uh, Native American Jews. And last week, um, I decided to make a sound piece about two meters or six feet. And um, I'll let you listen to that uh, before we close it out. And I, I uh, thank you for listening to me and my really strange uh, shelter-in-place artist talk.